In this section, we'll focus on the amine functional group. We've actually met the amine functional group in a previous section when we talked about the amide functional group. The reason for this is that we learned you can synthesize an amide functional group by combining a molecule that contains a carboxylic acid functional group and another molecule that contains an amine functional group. We saw then that amines are really just organic derivatives of the ammonia molecule, or NH3. Ammonia, like many molecules that contain a nitrogen atom, has nitrogen in a pyramidal arrangement. That means the nitrogen has three single bonds, as well as one electron pair. Amines are derivatives of ammonia because the ammonia's hydrogen atoms are replaced with one or more carbon-containing R groups. So an amine molecule can contain one, two, or three R groups. And not surprisingly, this is how we classify amines as primary amines, secondary amines, or tertiary amines. So for example, if I take the ammonia molecule and I replace one hydrogen atom with a methyl group, now I'm dealing with a primary amine. If I replace two hydrogen atoms with two different R groups, now I'm dealing with a secondary amine, and so on. The R groups can be the same as each other, or they can be different. One other arrangement you're likely to see when we talk about amines is a little bit different because it's the arrangement that exists when nitrogen has a fourth bond. This can happen when the electron pair on the nitrogen becomes involved in a fourth bond, and as a result, the nitrogen atom develops a positive charge. This is no longer, strictly speaking, an amine, but rather it's a structure called an ammonium ion. So ammonium ions often refer to amines that have developed a fourth bond, typically with a hydrogen atom, although it can also be with an R group. And this type of molecule will always have a positive charge on the nitrogen. As far as the intermolecular forces and interactions of amines with other molecules, because there are so many different ways an amine can exist, primary, secondary, or tertiary, as well as in this ammonium ion form, exactly which intermolecular forces and what solvents it'll be soluble with depend a lot on its individual structure. For most amines, we can say that they're generally polar molecules, although many of them are also capable of hydrogen bonding. In the case of ammonium ions, those structures are also ionic. Each one of these categories will tend to make a substance soluble with water and other polar solvents. However, like we've seen many times before, exactly which molecule and exactly how many carbons it contains also goes a long way to explaining whether that molecule will be soluble with water or in more organic solvents. Naming amines is a really straightforward process, and that's especially true when it comes to primary amines. The reason is primary amines are named much the same way we've named very simple molecules like alkanes, except we now have a new suffix. The IUPAC systematic suffix for the amine functional group is amine. Not terribly creative, but at least it's easy to remember. We simply apply this suffix to whatever the appropriate alkyl prefix is to get our name. Here's an example. This is an example of a primary amine because it contains nitrogen with three single bonds, and only one of the bonds is going to a carbon-containing group. In this case, there's only one carbon present. So if we were dealing with an alkane, we'd call this methane. But now we're going to use the amine suffix, which means the IUPAC name for this molecule would be methanamine. Methanamine is simply derived from starting with the methane name, removing the E, and replacing it with the amine suffix. Especially in the case of primary amines, you're likely to see these molecules written in a condensed form. And that's because writing a nitrogen with single bonds to the hydrogens doesn't really give us a lot of useful information. In condensed form, this is often written simply as NH2. So methanamine would appear as something like this, CH3 to represent the methyl group, and NH2 to represent the rest of the amine molecule. If we had two carbons on that R group, we'd have ethanamine. Three carbons would be propanamine, and so on. You will occasionally encounter common names for amines. 
And unlike with previous sections, I'm not going to ask you to memorize any specific common names. That's because most of these common names are pretty obvious what they mean when you hear them. So while I won't ask you to actually name molecules using common names, if I give you a common name, you should be able to figure out what it means. That shouldn't make you nervous because I think most of the time they'll be very obvious. For example, methanamine, if I were to give it a common name, would probably be called methylamine. Again, it just indicates an amine functional group with a methyl substituent. But as long as you know how to use IUPAC nomenclature, you'll be fine for this class. This was an example of a primary amine. Now let's look at what happens when we deal with secondary and tertiary amines. Secondary and tertiary amines will still use the same backbone that a primary amine name would use, but now we're going to use the capital N to designate nitrogen substituents. This is exactly the same as how we did this when we studied amide naming. So you can always go back and review that section as well. When we use the N designation for substituents, all we're doing is using an N instead of the way we use numbers on something like an alkane. Just remember, we're still going to choose the longest carbon chain as our backbone and name that using the amine suffix. Let's try an example. Here's an example of a secondary amine. It contains two different R groups. One contains one carbon and the other R group contains two carbons. I'll always choose the longest carbon chain or the largest R group as my backbone. In this case, the longest chain contains two carbons. I know that's associated with the eth prefix or the ethane alkane, so I know the backbone and therefore the base of my name here will be ethanamine. Now I have to designate what else is present on this amine molecule. In addition to the ethanamine part, I also have what is essentially a methyl substituent. So to designate that this is a methyl substituent and that it's located on the nitrogen, I'll use a capital N with a dash. When I put the name together, it will be called N-methylethanamine. Let's try another example. Take a second, pause the video, and see if you can name this molecule. First, I need to find the longest carbon chain. In this molecule, I have two R groups that contain two carbons, but then I have a third that contains three carbons. This will form the backbone, and therefore the name of this molecule will end with propanamine. Now I'm ready to name my substituents. In this case, my two substituents are both ethyl groups. So as we've seen previously when we named amides, I'm going to require an N for each one of these ethyl groups, but I can shorten the name by using the di prefix. That means the name of this molecule will be NN diethyl propanamine. Remember that we treat capital N's the same way we treat numbers. So we separate them from each other with commas, and we always separate them from letters with a dash. While well, I'll only ask you to be able to write IUPAC style names for primary, secondary, and tertiary amines, as we saw, common names can be prevalent, especially when dealing with primary amines. We also run into informal common names when it comes to secondary and tertiary amines that contain repetitive R groups. In other words, if you have two methyls or three ethyls. So then we would see prefixes like di or tri. That's most commonly just the case when you have the same R group more than once. So it's very common to see things like diethylamine or trimethylamine. Again, as long as you can make sense of them when you see them, I won't ask you to be able to actually write those names yourself. There is one other way you're likely to see the amine functional group represented in a molecule's name. And that's because when it comes to amines, many times the amine itself is actually relatively simple compared to the larger structure of the molecule. This is especially true when we're dealing with large or complex molecules and we have just a simple primary amine functional group. In cases like this, many times we refer to the amine not as the backbone of the molecule, but instead as a substituent. The term for a primary amine when treated as a substituent is to call it the amino substituent. Here's what that looks like. 
Imagine we have a really large molecule or a very complex organic structure which I'll represent with this blue blob. Inside of this blob might be dozens or hundreds of carbon and hydrogen atoms as well as other atoms or other functional groups. If connected to this larger structure we notice a primary amine functional group which is to say a single bond connects the nitrogen to the structure and then the nitrogen just contains two hydrogens. We'll call this the amino substituent and as a result we can name this molecule however we see fit but use amino to recognize the NH2 is also attached to the molecule. For example, let's say that instead of a blue blob, I have a benzene ring. I could call this, based on the fact that the benzene might be the backbone, aminobenzene. Notice that the NH2 is represented by the term amino. Aminobenzene, in fact, is so common and used in so many different settings that it has its own common name, which you should be familiar with. That common name is aniline. There's another place you've probably heard of the amino substituent, and that's in the term amino acids. Depending on what classes you've taken before or what sort of a background you have in the sciences, you may know of amino acids as the building block of proteins or you might just know that there's something that's in the food we eat. Amino acids are actually just organic molecules that contain both a carboxylic acid functional group and the amino substituent. That means they have a general structure like this. And all of the amino acids, including famous ones like cysteine and tryptophan, have this same basic structure with differences in what their R group is. So be aware that when we hear the term amino, we're actually referring to an amine, but we're using the amine as a substituent in the name rather than the backbone. Now, let's take some time to learn about the chemical reactivity of amines. One of the most important things to know about the chemical reactivity of amines is that all amines are bases. And depending on what definition of acids and bases you use, that can have slightly different meanings. But one of the most popular is the Brunsted-Lowry definition. So when we say that an amine can act as a Brunsted-Lowry base, that means that we're saying an amine can accept a hydrogen ion. This is the opposite of functional groups like the carboxylic acid functional group, which, because it's a Brunsted-Lowry acid, can donate a hydrogen ion. So amines, as bases, can accept hydrogen ions, but what is actually happening when an amine accepts a hydrogen ion? Well, remember, the amine functional group is simply a nitrogen with up to three R groups attached to it and an electron pair. When we say that the amine is accepting a hydrogen ion, what we really mean is it's bonding to it. The electron pair is attracted to the positively charged hydrogen ion. That electron pair then serves to form a new bond, and as a result, the amine structure will gain a fourth bond, and the nitrogen will develop a positive charge. Because we started with an amine, which is a base, the resulting product is generally referred to as the conjugate acid, basically the substance that exists after a base gains a hydrogen ion. In the case of amines, the conjugate acid is always an example of an ammonium ion. An ammonium ion is a general term, but you could also give specific names. For example, if your base was methanamine, the conjugate acid would be the methanammonium ion. Now, this is actually a reversible reaction. An amine can gain a hydrogen ion to form an ammonium ion, but under the right circumstances, an ammonium ion can also lose the hydrogen ion to regenerate the original amine. Whether or not this happens, and where the equilibrium exists for this particular reaction, depends on exactly what molecules are present. One of the most important factors is the strength of the base and its conjugate acid. We could talk about the strength of amine bases, but since we've already talked extensively about the strength of organic acids, like carboxylic acids, let's just consider the strength of a base's conjugate acid. The conjugate acid of an amine, or the ammonium ion, has a measurable pKa. And the typical pKa of most ammonium ions is between about 8 and 11. 9 and 10 are very, very common values. 
we can then use this information to predict whether the amine will be favored in a solution of a particular pH or whether the ammonium ion will be favored. And it'll be very similar to what we did with carboxylic acids. We won't talk in any more detail about the strength of amine bases. They are generally weak bases, although to what extent depends on the particular R groups that are present. As a general rule, aliphatic amines, which are amines that have simple R groups like methyl groups, ethyl groups, and so on, are generally stronger bases than aromatic amines, such as structures like purity. So all amines are basic, even though some are weaker bases than others. And that means that all amines are capable of accepting a hydrogen ion that comes from an acid or acidic solution. When an amine accepts that hydrogen ion, it forms the ammonium ion, which is positively charged. The fact that that changes a neutral organic molecule into something that is an ion has some extremely practical applications. And one of those is the formation of amine salts. If you remember from general chemistry, the word salt just means ionic compound. And there's a real advantage to changing an amine into an amine salt. That advantage has to do with solubility. Most complex amines, meaning amines that have multiple R groups with many different carbons, are insoluble in water. Basically, no matter how polar the amine group itself is, the presence of many, many carbons creates a large nonpolar area. As a result, complex amines are insoluble in water. Now this can be a problem if you need an amine to dissolve in water, and one of the times that that's very true is when we deal with pharmaceuticals. Many pharmaceuticals contain the amine functional group, and because a pharmaceutical needs to effectively dissolve in the human body to have any therapeutic effect, it's a problem if the amine functional group isn't soluble in water. For this reason, Many pharmaceuticals that contain the amine functional group are actually reacted with strong acid prior to being sold to consumers. It would work like this. Imagine you have a large therapeutic compound that contains the amine functional group. And again, it could be a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine. A very common acid to react it with is hydrochloric acid. We already saw that the electron pair on the nitrogen would be attracted to the hydrogen ion in hydrochloric acid. As a result, instead of having NH2, we would form NH3, and it would be positively charged. That would be the ammonium ion. But what happens to this chlorine? Well, that's not actually a chlorine atom. That's a chloride ion. It's negatively charged. That means that if we allow this reaction to happen, what will be left at the end is the ammonium cation and the chloride anion. If we sell the pharmaceutical in this form, it'll be much more soluble in water than it would have without it. This is what we call an amine salt, and its solubility is a huge advantage for any substance that needs to dissolve in the human body, because the human body, whether we're talking about the bloodstream or the digestive system, tends to be very aqueous in nature. Let's look at some examples of pharmaceuticals that undergo this reaction. Here's an example of an over-the-counter pharmaceutical that you may have taken before. This is pseudoephedrine. Notice that pseudoephedrine contains a benzene ring, an alcohol functional group, and, most importantly, an amine functional group. In this case, it's a secondary amine because there's two bonds going to different R groups and one bond going to a hydrogen. In this form, pseudoephedrine would not be soluble in water. That's because it contains too many carbons compared to its polar functional groups. That means this pseudoephedrine wouldn't dissolve in your mouth, in your digestive tract, or in your bloodstream. So the way it's sold when you buy it at a store is actually a pseudoephedrine HCl. That's pseudoephedrine that's been reacted with hydrochloric acid. Reacting pseudoephedrine's amine group with a hydrochloric acid means that the nitrogen will form a fourth bond to the hydrogen from the hydrochloric acid and the entire molecule will become positively charged. Because it's positively charged, it'll be attracted to the negative charge on the chloride ion. So, you'd actually be taking pseudoephedramonium chloride. 
but we just call it pseudoephedrine HCl. This pseudoephedrine form would be far more soluble everywhere in the human body where water is present, including the digestive tract and the bloodstream. Because the amine functional group becomes far more soluble after reacting with hydrochloric acid or any other strong acid, this is a common tactic that's used when we need to make pharmaceuticals or supplements more soluble in the aqueous parts of the human body. So as you start to notice, either on over-the-counter medication, prescription medication, or just general supplements, many, many times they contain HCl in the name. That HCl doesn't mean hydrochloric acid is present, but rather that the compound in question has been reacted with hydrochloric acid to increase its solubility in water. Now, an amine will always chemically react with a hydrochloric acid or any other strong acid to create an amine salt. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a strong acid in order for an amine to accept a hydrogen ion. In fact, much like the carboxylic acids that we've seen previously, you might think of amines as being able to exist in two different forms. One form is the amine itself a nitrogen with three single bonds and an electron pair. But the other form is the amine that's gained a hydrogen ion. We know that this is an ammonium ion. It's recognizable as a nitrogen with four bonds and a positive charge. We could say that the ammonium form of an amine is just a protonated amine. In other words, an amine that's gained a hydrogen ion. You could think about the amine as being deprotonated because it's essentially an ammonium minus a hydrogen ion, but it doesn't necessarily mean it contains no hydrogen. Many amines, particularly primary and secondary amines, have to contain hydrogens even when they're in their neutral amine form. Now again, like the carboxylic acids we've seen before, figuring out whether the amine form will be prevalent or the ammonium ion form will be prevalent depends on a couple different factors. The two most important factors are the amine itself and the chemical environment that we place the amine into. When we think about the amine itself, what we really need to know is exactly how strong of a base it is. And as I mentioned previously, the easiest way to think about that in terms of how we've seen it before is actually to think about the pKa of the ammonium ion. The pKa will serve as a dividing line that tells us which form, the ammonium ion or the amine, will be favored under different conditions. And those conditions are the second thing we need to know. The conditions as we'll see them typically are what the pH of a solution is. Just like we saw with carboxylic acids, when placed into a solution that has a very low pH and therefore a lot of hydrogen ions, that means that there'll be plenty of hydrogen ions present to chemically react with the amine and form the ammonium ion. So in other words, at very low pHs, like 1, 2, 3, and so on, we'll tend to see the ammonium ion form of an amine dominate. If we go to higher pHs, pHs that are above the pKa of a given amine, now there's not enough hydrogen ion present for the amine to become protonated. So instead, the neutral form of the amine, or the initial amine, is what will be most prevalent. Remember, most ammonium ions have pKa values around 9 or 10. That means that at pHs lower than 9, we'll tend to see the ammonium ion present, and at pHs higher than 10, we'll tend to see the amine be present. Let's try an example. When you're approaching problems that revolve around pH and pKa, generally a good rule is just to remember that at low pHs, most molecules will be protonated. At higher pHs, most molecules will be deprotonated, and the dividing line is the pKa of the molecule in question. For this example, draw the structure of dimethylamine which has a pKa of 10.6, when placed in the solution of pH 6. Pause the video and see if you can correctly draw the structure. To correctly draw the structure of dimethylamine at a pH of 6, 
we have to first decide what is the structure of dimethylamine and then decide whether or not it would become protonated and accept a hydrogen ion at that particular pH. So first let's draw the structure of dimethylamine. We know amines are based around a nitrogen and dimethylamine will consist of two methyl groups which means one hydrogen will also be attached to the nitrogen. This is dimethylamine. Now at pH 6 we're dealing with a pH which is lower than our pKa. When your pH is lower than the pKa, we're dealing with a molecule that will become protonated. So because amines start out as bases, they're capable of accepting a hydrogen ion to become protonated. So to draw this molecule in its protonated form, my nitrogen will actually have four bonds. It will still have the same three bonds it started with two to methyl groups and one to hydrogen, but it will have a fourth bond to a new hydrogen ion, and as a whole the molecule will be positively charged. This is the dimethyl ammonium ion, or in other words, it's the protonated form of dimethylamine, and that's the structure that will be favored at a pH of six, because we were below the pKa. If the pH had been 11, 12, 13, or higher, we would have left the structure as the original amine. Now because this pH and pKa information can be a lot to remember, and because it affects more than just the amine functional group, I think this is a good opportunity to stop and do a quick summary. We've just seen that amines can exist as the neutral amine form or as a protonated ammonium ion form. The amine form meaning an amine molecule with just three bonds, either to hydrogens or R groups, and an electron pair, tends to exist at pHs higher than the pKa of the particular substance. In a pH lower than the pKa, we get the ammonium ion form, and the ammonium ion always has a nitrogen with four bonds, three of which are part of the initial amine structure, and one is with an additional hydrogen ion. Notice that the ammonium ion is an ion, and as we've just said, that makes it far more soluble in water. This is actually very similar to what we saw with carboxylic acids. We know that the carboxylic acid functional group contains a carbonyl bond as well as a bond to an OH. The carboxylic acid structure, much like the amine structure, is able to change depending on the pH of a solution. Under the right conditions, a carboxylic acid can lose a hydrogen or become deprotonated, forming the carboxylate ion. Notice that in this case, we've also created an ion, and carboxylate ions, as well as the salts that they can be part of, are far more soluble in water than carboxylic acids. So let's notice a couple different things about these relationships. The first is, with all of these different forms, we think of the pKa as a dividing line. When the pH is below the pKa, we're talking about molecules that either keep their hydrogen ion, in the case of carboxylic acids, or gain an additional hydrogen ion in the case of amines that become ammoniums. If we talk about pHs that are above the pKa, now we're dealing with molecules that either remain as they are, or if they can, lose a hydrogen ion. So amines remain in their initial structure at a pH higher than their pKa, but carboxylic acids donate their hydrogen ion to form the carboxylate ion. Even though the pKa is the dividing line for all of these circumstances, the pKa is quite different for these different pairs of compounds. Remember that in the case of the ammonium ion, we said the pKa is between values of approximately 8 and 11. When it comes to carboxylic acids, the values are between about three and six. Now that has some very interesting applications and very interesting consequences when it comes to placing these molecules into solutions with different pHs, because under the right circumstances, each one of these substances could become ionic and therefore be far more soluble in water, or it could remain neutral. Notice that in each case, we think about the initial functional group as being in its neutral form, 
and the adjusted form, whether it's the ammonium ion or the carboxylate ion, is the ionic or charged form, the one that's more soluble in water. So two things here. The first is, how do you remember all this? Well, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. But for me, I've always found the most helpful thing is just to remember that at low pHs, meaning pHs that are lower than the pKa, there's a lot of hydrogen ions present. In other words, there's a high concentration of hydrogen ions. And as a result, the carboxylic acid will keep its hydrogen and the amine will gain a hydrogen. If I go in the other direction to very high pHs, you know, values like 11, 12, 13, 14, because there's less hydrogen ions there, each one of these structures will exist with as few hydrogen ions as possible. And as a result, you'll have the amine in its neutral form or the carboxylate ion. The other thing that's significant about this is how this affects molecules that contain these functional groups in the human body. Because different areas of the human body, especially the digestive tract and the bloodstream, have very different pHs. And as a molecule, let's say it was a pharmaceutical, moves through areas that have different pHs, it can become protonated in the case of an amine, or it can become deprotonated in the case of the carboxylic acid functional group. So let's see how that actually works. This is often what's referred to as the solubility switch because it means you can take the same organic compound and just by passing it through different pHs, it can change forms. So this is true for both organic acids, like carboxylic acids, and organic bases, such as amines. When each one of these substances is in its ionic form, whether it's positively charged or negatively charged, it will become far more soluble in aqueous solutions. And that includes aqueous solutions in the human body, such as the digestive tract, in your mouth, in your stomach, and in your bloodstream. If a molecule is in its neutral form, now it'll be less soluble in water, but it'll be more soluble in nonpolar solvents. Now there's not a lot of nonpolar solvents in the human body, but what you do have are your tissues. Many of the molecules that make up your tissues are nonpolar, at least on their outer edges. And because of that, a molecule that is neutral will be more able to partition or move into tissues, which is one way to be absorbed by the human body. And just to give you some perspective on how dramatic these changes can be, think about the most acidic area of the human body, which is the stomach. The stomach has a pH of about one or two, depending on exactly who you are, what you've eaten, and what your genetics are like. At a pH of two, virtually all molecules will become protonated, and that includes carboxylic acids, which will remain as carboxylic acids, and amines, which will actually become ammonium ions. So in the stomach, your carboxylic acid-containing pharmaceuticals will actually be neutral and they'll be more effective at partitioning into tissue, whereas your amine-containing pharmaceuticals become ionic. And when they're ionic, they're more likely to stay dissolved in water and not partition into tissue. That changes dramatically even as those molecules leave the stomach and enter the duodenum, also called the duodenum. Your duodenum has a pH of about six. At six, this is above the pKa of many carboxylic acids, and as a result, they will become deprotonated. It's still, however, below the pKa of many amines. So most amines will actually still remain protonated at this point, making it very unlikely either type of compound would actually partition into the tissues. In the small intestine, the pH gets even higher. And again, this differs depending on different individuals and the circumstances, but you can see there's pretty dramatic changes in pH. Furthermore, the large intestines drop a little bit in pH, and at the end of this all, if something's able to move into the bloodstream, most people have a bloodstream pH of around 7.3. At that particular pH, most carboxylic acids would be deprotonated, but again, most amines would remain protonated and therefore be ionic. That makes them more soluble in the bloodstream and less likely to partition into the body tissues. This is a problem that plagues pharmaceutical scientists because a compound is only effective in the human body if the human body can actually absorb it. 
And as you may know, if you have any background in pharmaceuticals or just any practical experience with them, a pharmaceutical that doesn't get absorbed by the human body basically creates expensive urine. In other words, it just passes right out of the system. So pharmaceutical scientists are always interested in understanding how their different compounds react in the different pHs of the human body. In our next section, we'll finish up talking about amines by talking about some very interesting substances that affect the human body called alkaloids. By now, you've probably noticed that I keep bringing up pharmaceutical examples when talking about the amine functional group. That's not a coincidence. Rather, that's because there are literally hundreds of different examples of amine compounds that have interesting physiological effects on the human body. In fact, even before scientists had any understanding of organic structure or functional groups, we understood that certain substances could affect the human body, whether they were ingested, inhaled, or even injected. Many of these substances were originally derived from plants, and they were given the general term alkaloid. Now notice alkaloid sounds like the word alkaline, which is an old term meaning basic. That's because most alkaloids contain the amine functional group, which makes the compounds basic in nature. But what are these alkaloid compounds? Well, as I said, originally all alkaloids were derived from plants. And the thinking was that they basically served as naturally occurring pesticides. For example, if a plant needs to protect its leaves from being eaten, maybe from a pest like a caterpillar, if those leaves contain a substance that tastes bad or is toxic to the caterpillar, it helps protect the plant. Now, that compound might have a very negative effect on a small creature like a caterpillar, but when used in particular amounts for larger creatures like human beings, we may find that it has effects that are desirable. Maybe they're therapeutic or something that we enjoy, as we'll see in a couple upcoming examples. Now that we have a better understanding of what many of these substances are, we still use the term alkaloid, but we use it a little more judiciously. The term alkaloid now means an organic compound that contains nitrogen and usually has some physiological effects on human beings. That nitrogen, in most examples, is part of an amine functional group. So let's look at some examples of alkaloids that you're undoubtedly familiar with. The first example I want to show you is one you've probably heard of and you may have even enjoyed today. It is caffeine. Caffeine is a classic example of an alkaloid. It contains four nitrogen atoms, three of which are amine functional groups. And while we think of caffeine these days as being in coffee and soda, it is a naturally occurring substance that exists in dozens of different plants. Probably the plant it's most famous for coming from is the seeds of the coffee plant, which are what we just generally refer to as coffee beans. In fact, it's from coffee beans that caffeine was first isolated in 1820 in France, and that's where it got its name from, café, which is French for coffee. Because caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant, we associate it with helping us feel more alert or awake. But like most alkaloids, it can also be dangerous in high enough amounts. In fact, caffeine's lethal dose is about 150 to 200 milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight. When you consider that most beverages have between 30 and 100 milligrams of caffeine in them, that means you'd probably have to drink 100 cups of coffee to approach that limit. But theoretically, it is possible to suffer a caffeine overdose. Another alkaloid that's really closely related to caffeine in structure is theobromine. And if you look carefully at the theobromine structure, you'll notice there's only one difference between caffeine and theobromine. It has to do with the nitrogen located here and whether it's attached to a hydrogen or a methyl group. Theobromine is actually a cardiac stimulant that's present in many different plants, most famously in chocolate. In fact, that's where the term theobromine comes from. Notice there's no bromine atoms in theobromine. Instead, this was derived from the scientific name for the cocoa plant, theobroma. Theobromine is a cardiac stimulant, and in fact, about 10% of the caffeine you consume turns into theobromine in your body. That means that when you consume caffeine, you get the central nervous system stimulant effect, as well as the cardiac stimulating effect of theobromine. 
Another thing theobromine is famous for is the fact that it's toxic to dogs. This is why dogs and some other animals can't consume chocolate safely. The lethal dose for theobromine in dogs, it's much higher than even the lethal dose for caffeine in humans. But if you have a small dog and it consumes a large amount of very dark, high quality chocolate, it can be fatal. So make sure you keep chocolate away from dogs. And I know a certain chemistry instructor that would be happy to take any chocolate off your hands if you don't want it around. One more interesting alkaloid that goes along in this general family is nicotine. Now, nicotine has a different structure than caffeine and theobromine, but again, you can still see that it contains two nitrogen atoms, one of which is definitely part of an amine functional group. Nicotine's definitely most famous for being in cigarettes, but again, it is naturally occurring. It's naturally occurring in many different plants, although the tobacco plant obviously is the most famous. Nicotine is a central nervous system stimulant, and it also has some really interesting neurochemistry that we won't go into. But like caffeine and theobromine, it also has a lethal dose. Consuming as little as 50 milligrams per kilogram of nicotine can be fatal. And while that's very unlikely to happen from smoking cigarettes, which usually result in a dose of about one milligram of nicotine per cigarette, for people that work with nicotine, nicotine can actually be absorbed through the skin, creating a problem. It's also become a problem as nicotine gum and nicotine patch use has become more widespread. In fact, caffeine, theobromine, and nicotine can all be absorbed relatively well through human skin. And while that's the basis for how nicotine patches work, if you want a really good Christmas present for that person who can never get enough caffeine, if you go online, you can actually search for caffeinated soap and using that soap in the shower will give you a dose that's equivalent to about one cup of coffee. So there's three things that we very commonly take in as human beings, all of which manipulate our physiology. Now, let me show you a few more examples of alkaloids. These are ones that are used in a medicinal setting for their therapeutic effect. The first one is morphine. Morphine is an example of an opiate. And it gets that term because it was originally derived from the opium drug in the early 1800s. The opium drug, in turn, came from a particular type of poppy. Now, morphine, as well as opium, has pain relieving or analgesic effects. But in fact, morphine's use as a drug goes back to as early as 1827, when the Merck company started selling it as a pain reliever. Morphine as an opiate is closely related to other medications that are also opiates. For example, codeine and oxycodone. If you look at the structures of these three substances, you can see they're incredibly similar. The difference between morphine, codeine, and oxycodone simply has to do with the arrangement of the nitrogen ring in the center of the molecule and some minor differences about the substituents on the ring. Now, while morphine was originally derived from plants and codeine was derived from morphine, these days all of these substances are produced in a laboratory synthetically. Let's look at a couple other alkaloids. This is one of my favorite alkaloids because it has kind of an interesting story associated with it. This is the alkaloid solanine. And again, it's found in many different plants, but the one it might be most famous for is because it can be found in certain potatoes. Now, if you look at the word solanine, or listen to the way it's pronounced, you may be reminded of the word solar. And in fact, solanine tends to exist in potatoes that have been exposed to sunlight. They start to produce higher amounts of solanine. This is a problem because solanine is extremely toxic. Remember we said caffeine has a toxicity level of about 150 to 200 milligrams per kilogram? Well, solanine's lethal dose is about three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight for the average human. And potatoes normally contain very small amounts of solanine, but when they're exposed to the sun, they start to contain higher concentrations of it. So, Eating a potato that's been exposed to a lot of sunlight and therefore contains higher concentrations of solanine can make you extremely ill. It can even kill you. So how do you know that the potato you grew or the potato you buy in the store hasn't been exposed to that sunlight and hasn't created this solanine compound? Well, there's two things to watch for. The first is taste. Solanine has an incredibly bitter taste, so much so that if you did bite into a potato that had high concentrations, you'd probably stop eating it. The other has to do with a side effect of being exposed to sunlight. 
When potatoes are exposed to sunlight, they start to generate chlorophyll, which if you've taken a biology class, you know it's green. So when you look at a green potato, the green color is chlorophyll, but it may indicate that there are dangerous levels of solanine present. And pretty much all of us have seen a green potato at some point in our lives. You probably just didn't realize that eating it could kill you. So stay away from the green potatoes. They're not good for you. Let me show you two other compounds that I don't have to tell you to stay away from because you naturally would do that. These two compounds are relatively simple, especially compared to the enormous structure of solanine. They're basically diamines. They contain two amine groups connected by a long carbon chain. So what makes these compounds so famous? Well, these compounds tend to be the result of certain mm, decaying processes that happen in nature. And as your nose knows, when something decays, usually it doesn't have the greatest smell. These two substances are called cadaverine and putrescine. These are two of the substances that cause rotting flesh to smell so repugnant to so many people. And there's actually something interesting happening here. Many biologists believe that the fact that you're repulsed by these smells is an evolutionary adaptation. Imagine that a caveman is walking along and finds a deer that's been dead for a week. Well, after an animal dies and all the microorganisms set to work, it doesn't become terribly healthy to eat that particular meat. So if you were repelled by these smells, you might not eat it, and you might go on to procreate another day. Another interesting thing to mention about these compounds is they're not only produced by rotting flesh. In fact, there are certain plants that produce these compounds, and the most famous is a plant called the corpse flower. Now, when you hear the word flower, usually we think about something pretty that smells good. So that usually attracts you towards it. What's the advantage of a flower smelling bad? Well, as I mentioned before, when flesh decays, that attracts all sorts of microorganisms as well as insects, and insects pollinate. So we actually have a corpse flower here in the greenhouse at Spokane Community College. And when it's in bloom, the entire greenhouse smells like rotting flesh. It's not the coolest thing, but it is the coolest thing, if you know what I mean. So cadaverine and putrescine, two compounds you didn't know about before, but you probably won't forget anytime soon. Okay, so now that we've seen some examples of alkaloids, I'd like to finish up this section by talking about how we synthesize compounds like this. And it's what's called total synthesis. Not surprisingly, total synthesis refers to totally synthesizing a substance. In other words, making a complex organic product from relatively simple reactants. Most of the reactions that we've done in our class involve mixing together some reactants and making a product. That's not totally different from how total synthesis occurs. It's just that in total synthesis, we tend to have to go through many intermediate steps. So instead of mixing reactants to make a product, you mix some simple reactants to make a more complex intermediate, and then you mix that intermediate with some other reactants to make another intermediate, and you proceed through however many steps you need until you really attain your final product. This is very frequently used to synthesize natural products such as alkaloids. Because if you think about it, it really would be impractical for us to derive some of these substances from their natural sources. We'll talk about a specific example in a minute, but sometimes it's financially not viable. Sometimes it's just a real problem because having enough of the natural source can be an issue. The most common approach to total synthesis is what's called retrosynthetic analysis a big term that basically means working backwards. So in retrosynthetic analysis, you look at what the product is and you start to imagine pulling it apart. And you figure out what pieces are this product made of and how can I make those individual pieces. Now I want to show you a real life example of total synthesis just so you can have some appreciation for how complex these synthesis schemes can become. The example I'm going to use is one that was especially relevant when I was going to school because it had just been discovered. It is the complete synthesis of Taxol, which is also called Paclitaxel. Taxol is a chemotherapeutic drug. It's a drug that's used in chemotherapy to treat several different types of cancers. 
Taxol was actually identified in the 1960s as having chemotherapeutic qualities. And it was identified as part of a program by the American government where they would literally just collect hundreds of samples from different types of plants and then test them in the lab to see if they could be used to treat cancer. The Taxol sample was derived from the Pacific yew tree. And there's a major problem with this. The Pacific yew tree only grows, as the name implies, in the Pacific Northwest. It grows along the coast of Oregon, Washington, and up through Canada. And it's not a terribly common tree. In order to derive the taxol, the tree has to be stripped of its bark, and the bark basically has to be processed until you get a very, very small amount of the drug. So the problem with this is even if taxol turned out to be very effective against cancer, which to some extent it has been, its cost and availability would always be tied to this fairly uncommon tree in the Pacific Northwest. So the solution, as is the solution with many alkaloids, is to derive a complete synthesis. In other words, find some compounds that you can buy from a chemical supply company, mix them together in the correct order and the right chemical conditions, and in the end, make your desired product, in this case, Taxol. That sounds relatively simple, and it's not, because of the number of intermediate steps that are required. In the 1960s, Taxol was identified as having a good potential to be used to treat cancer. The first successful synthesis didn't occur until 1994, and it was done by the Robert A. Holton Research Group at Florida State University. Holton had actually started working on this in 1982, so it took 12 years for them to figure out the steps. And part of that is because of the number of steps that are required. So let me show you now the Taxol total synthesis. This will not be on the test. In order to create Taxol, the Holton group started with a compound that was derived from patchouli oil. Again, originally derived from a plant, but now widely available. And this substance, they ran through a series of reactions. Now in the synthesis scheme you're looking at, each arrow with a letter over it represents one chemical reaction. And we could go look up, based on the letter A, for instance, what was actually used to do the reaction. So in the first step, you can see that they started with an epoxide, and they changed the bonding around so they had an alcohol group and an alkene. That's one step. Then they continued. So in total, here's the first 12 steps of the taxol synthesis. 12 wasn't enough to make taxol, so here's the next step, up through step 16. In each one of these, remember, there's a reaction. And as you guys have seen in the laboratory, each reaction requires some cooking, some boiling, some distilling, some purification, some extraction. Any one of those could be used multiple times. So how many steps were required to do the complete total synthesis of Taxol by the Holton group? Well, they reached Taxol on the 45th step. So it took 44 steps, 44 different chemical reactions, to turn this simple looking reactant into the valuable chemotherapy agent Taxol. This is what organic chemists do. They figure out how to start with one substance and change it into a substance that's more desirable. Now to finish, I want to give you an opportunity to earn some extra credit as relates to this topic of total synthesis. And to do that, I'm going to ask you, if you'd like, to learn more about a famous chemist named Percy Julian. Percy Julian was a really interesting scientist. He was born in 1899 in the United States, and he went on to become only the fourth African American in history to earn a PhD in chemistry. Unfortunately, he fought racism his entire life. And you'll notice he earned his PhD in Vienna, in Europe, because nobody in America was willing to grant him a PhD. Fortunately, he came back to the United States and he went on to become an organic chemist that specialized in natural product synthesis. If you choose to do this assignment, which is really pretty easy, you'll learn a lot about the different products he's involved with and you'll probably be amazed by how many things you take for granted Percy Julian had a hand in. So what I'd ask you to do, if you want to do some extra credit, is there's a PBS Nova documentary called Forgotten Genius. It's a little bit less than an hour and a half long, and it's pretty interesting. And it covers his life and the chemistry he did. What I'll do is post on our website a worksheet that you can follow along as you watch the video and just fill in the answers. It's supposed to be a pretty easy assignment, and I think you'll find it to be interesting.
The other thing about this documentary, it will make you feel pretty smart and you will probably laugh a couple times because they have some fairly dramatic scenes involving taking melting points in the organic chemistry laboratory. I give you permission to laugh at those scenes. But also, when the chemists that they interview start to talk about organic structures and molecules, you'll probably be pleasantly surprised to see how much chemistry you've really learned this quarter. So, that concludes the topics of alkaloids and amines. I'll put a worksheet up on our website if you'd like to do the extra credit on the NOVA documentary, and let me know if you have any questions.